everyone. My name is Reverend Vinita Rodman Jenkins. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm one of the co-pastors here, co-pastor of teaching and community. And I'm just so grateful that you are here worshiping with us today. What a wonderful worship experience we've been having. Shout out to everyone who's joining us virtually. And certainly for those of you who are in the house, I Again, I'm so grateful for your presence. We are continuing our Bible Say What series. And we're looking at how did Jesus and the disciples read the Bible. The Bible. I come today with the Bible that was given to me by Reverend Dorothy Neal, who, was, um, who actually is a member of Community Baptist Church in Inglewood, New Jersey. And she actually had it engraved for me. It says, Minister Vinita Rodman. So this was before I was ordained, and it meant so much to me that she gave it to me. And um, I know that we're doing the, the digital thing. We have our Bibles electronically. But I was really happy to bring my Bible to church today during this series. So it was 1994. I had just given my initial sermon, my very first sermon, or as they refer to it, my, my trial sermon. And I um, had to, after that trial sermon, sit before a board of elders. And I was very nervous. And it was their job to ask me a number of theological questions. Let's just say it was their job to interrogate me. And they asked me questions because they wanted to know about my understanding of the Bible and God. And they wanted to know more about my journey and my call to ministry. They were there to witness my call and ultimately consecrate me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So after they asked their questions, they asked me if I had a question to ask. And I had a question. And I said, I just want to know, how do you all feel about seminary? And they looked a little puzzled. And I said, the reason I'm asking is because whenever you all talk about seminary, when I've heard sermons from various pastors and ministers in this organization, it's always very negative. And, you know, I think that um, you only encourage people to attend the Bible college associated with this organization. So I wanted to know how they felt. I also reminded them that whenever I've heard anything about the seminary, they've always referred to it as the cemetery. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the reason this was because they felt that if you went to seminary, it would challenge your faith. It would turn you away from the Bible in the way that they taught it. And it would sort of deter you from anything that they had put inside of us. So um, I was surprised by their answer. Um, I was proud of myself that I was able to do this. I was late 20s. And I just felt like God gave me the courage. And I was surprised, suspiciously surprised by their answer. They said, oh, well, we're, we're fine with seminary. You should just go to seminary. And I said... Okay, so um, I went to seminary, 1997, I enrolled at New York Theological Seminary, and I have to be honest, I was still guarded, because I had been in this organization for so many years, and I wasn't sure if, like, something would happen to me. So I remained cautiously optimistic. I knew it was something that I wanted to do, but I was a little hesitant about what the full experience would involve. And I had a number of barriers up, but I still was intrigued, and I was still engaged in all that was happening around me. I love the courses, the church history, Greek and Hebrew, uh, women in the Bible, uh, the Christian ethics, and critical interpretation. And there was so much that was being opened up to me, and I was very, very excited but then I start to feel frustrated because, I mean, I wasn't all in, but I was still frustrated that no one had shared this information with me. And no one had sort of explained things and taught me things in the way that I was experiencing in seminary. But at a certain point, I began to fully open up and feel a sense of liberation as I began to think critically about a book that I was taught not to question ever 
I began to see it as a new experience where this treasure chest was being reopened and I had to dig deeper. My professor of Greek, the late Minka Sprague, encouraged us to dance with the text as we listened to the retelling of story after story. Some of us were dancing, some of us were wrestling, some of us were struggling. I was experiencing all of the above. And I had heard so many stories told through a certain lens for so long that it was a little jarring. But now, class after class, the stories were being retold. They were being recapitulated, as author Rob Bell says in What is the Bible? They were being essentially retold in a different way. He goes on to say, when you retell a story, you don't remove the nasty bits or the unfortunate events. You include them. But in retelling things, they appear in a new light. They are what they are, and yet, when they are retold, they take on new meaning and new perspective. This was probably the experience that Jesus and his disciples had as they read scripture. Scripture was being shown in a new light, and this new light connects with three words we're going to explore today. Interpretation, incarnation, and invitation. Let's start with interpretation. So in Jesus' day, no one had a Bible. In fact, it was 1,500 years before the invention of the printing press, so people didn't walk around with books. They read scrolls, and the scrolls were rare. And there were probably only a few scrolls in Jesus' village, a few sacred scrolls kept in the synagogue in a cabinet called an ark. And there were scrolls of the prophets' writings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and such, the wisdom writings, such as the book of Job, history books um, entailing and the life of King David, and the Torah. The scroll named for the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Torah means way. It means teaching, law, instruction. So everything within Jesus' world centered around the Torah. On their Sabbath day, the worship leader would take the Torah scroll out of the ark and parade it through the congregation, inviting everyone to dance in honor of the Torah. They would open the scroll and someone would read from it. And then they would have a discussion about its meaning and how you live it out. This would be something that everyone would engage in. People's questions and thoughts and opinions were all welcomed. The questions were actually seen as a sign of life. Life because it showed that people were actually engaged. Have you ever been exposed to the reading of the Bible in this way? How have you been exposed to the reading of the text? Has it been more individually or more in the midst of community? Have you seen anyone take a Bible, <laughs> open it up, and dance through the pews? <laughs> yeah. Now, I've seen people dance through the pews, but not necessarily with the Bible. <laughs> but I wonder what our churches would be like and how our lives and communities would be transformed if our reading of the Bible was done in this fashion. In Jesus' day, the Torah, the prophets, and the wisdom writings started the discussion. In the church culture of today, the Bible typically ends the discussion. In Jesus' day, the discussion begins after the scroll was read, in the midst of community, in the midst of the people, and you interpreted it together. There were discussions about life, how do you live, how do you treat people, and how you conduct yourself. In our day, someone preaches from the Bible, we interpret the text, we tell you what to do, and typically, this is the end of the story. 
I'm sure that some of you have heard it said that the Bible says it, and that settles it. And there are no more questions asked. In one aspect, we're starting the discussion with the reading of the text. In the other aspect, we're ending the discussion with the reading of the text. When people would come to Jesus and ask questions in the New Testament, most of the time they're asking questions about the Torah and how the Torah should be interpreted. In many instances, when Jesus is asked a question, what does Jesus do? How does Jesus respond? With what? A question. That's right. How do you read it? What do you think it says? How do you interpret it? I'm sure our teachers and, teachers and professors and, and facilitators in the room know all about this, right? Someone in class asks a question, and then you throw it back to the group. What do you think? To engage different voices. So down through the generation, some people <clears throat> interpreted Scripture in one way and some another way. However, as these interpretations evolved, all of it was done with a desire to live life to the full. For Jesus and his disciples, the Bible was not just a helpful religious text. It was seen as a blueprint revealing the deepest realities of the universe. It was seen as an expression of love between the divine and the human. Jesus and his disciples understood these books to be particular to their people and yet universal. They were divine words for everyone, everywhere, and it had to be interpreted. You read it, your people read it, and then you made decisions about how you would live it out. What does it mean to love your neighbor? How do you honor and respect life? How do you keep one day holy? How do you best care for the poor? And so on. You lived with the assumption that there was always something new to learn and discuss because life never stops bringing you events and circumstances that will cause you to ask, what is the best thing to do here in this particular situation? Amen? So let's shift now from interpretation to incarnation. Jesus tells the crowd in the book of Matthew, he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. So in other words, he didn't come to miss the point of the law, but he came to fulfill it, to embody it, to actually show what it looks like to live it out. This was the goal of fulfilling the Torah to take the words and bring them to life in your life. That's the movement of the Bible, from word to flesh. This is the meaning of the word incarnation. Powerful and mysterious things happen when the word is acted out in the real world by real people. When Jesus says that he's come to fulfill the Torah, he has come to breathe life into it. He's come to make it speak. He shared with his followers in various instances that you've heard the Torah being interpreted this way, but I'm here to tell you about these new interpretations. So when Jesus saw a group that had been shunned or marginalized, he intentionally moved toward them with his love. And with his light, women, Samaritans, lepers, those who were deemed unclean. He does not follow the dominant interpretations of his day where some were in and others were out. Jesus was trying to convey that there was something new and powerful that was happening in the life of his people and in the world through him. As the fulfillment of the law, Jesus had come to set the captives free. He had come to proclaim good news to the poor. He had come to recover sight for the blind. He had come to bring liberation to the oppressed. I wonder 
how our lives would be impacted if we took the words of the Bible and in incarnated them, if we brought them to life in our own lives, where the word would become flesh and essentially move into the neighborhood, as the Message Bible puts it, where we use the pages of scripture to move people towards each other, to create spaces where we would all be included, where everyone would feel a sense of belonging, where equity would exist, where there would be full inclusion, where its words would not lead to shame or judgment or prejudice or discrimination, but abundant life. Rob Bell says incarnation raises questions about the very nature of what it means to be human. Are we just particular relationships of cells and synapses and blood and bones, or is there something divine, something infinite, something eternal residing in every one of us? Incarnation is so compelling. It's mysterious, and it's a powerful concept. Jesus came to put flesh on the Torah, and he makes new interpretations. And then he invites us into the discussion. Our final word is invitation. Jesus tells his followers that it is their turn to make decisions about what is written in the Bible. It's as if he's saying, listen, you've seen me do it. You've seen me in action. Now it's your turn. What will you do? You figure it out, what it means to put flesh on it in your own world, in your own context, within your own spheres of influence. There is so much to discover in scripture. There are so many treasures. Jesus even tells his disciples in John 14 and 12, I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me will be able to do what I have done, but they will do even greater things because I will return to be with the Father. Greater things. What if this is an invitation for us to keep engaging, keep arguing, keep wrestling, and to keep dancing with the text? Perhaps it is because for the rest of the New Testament, we see Jesus' followers discussing, debating, wrestling, working out what the divine life looks like wherever they find themselves. I'm happy to report I made it through seminary. <laughs> I graduated with my Master's of Divinity in 2002 up at Riverside Church. And as I went through seminary and after I graduated, I learned to say, like we say here at Forefront, I take the Bible too seriously to take it literally. I had to trust the process. And I had to allow its words to bring new meaning and inspiration to my life. I had to read scripture. I had to read and begin as a result of what I was reading to sing a new song so that I could help other people reconnect, rediscover, and reclaim new significance and understanding within its pages. We all have an opportunity to consider the three words, interpretation, incarnation, and invitation. We are invited to embrace new interpretations and welcome all people regardless of their identity. We're invited to take the words of the Bible and bring them to life in our own lives. We're invited to keep on interpreting, to keep engaging, to keep arguing, to keep wrestling, and to keep dancing with the Bible.
And I believe we can do this as a community, in community, hearing different voices. And it's awesome to see this playing out right here at Forefront. After the service, we bring together a group to discuss what has been shared through the sermon. We call that Kinship Cafe, and it has gained great popularity. And not only do we do that in person, we do it online in the virtual space with Foxy, who talks to those parishioners who want to tune in virtually. That's one way we can do it in community. We can do this in the myriad of small groups that we have as we continue to think about wrestling and dancing with the text. We can do this as we continue to lean in to our anti-racism values, as we continue to involve ourselves with the community outside of these four walls. We can do this as we all travel to Albany on February 8th for Advocacy Day to ensure that New York State abolishes, fully abolishes slavery. We can do this by paying attention and standing up against pro police brutality time and time again. We can do this by letting the Bible be the beginning of, this, of the discussion and not the end. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.